So menopause, what is it? Again, you can't really say for sure that you're in menopause until you've gone a whole year without a period. So it's almost a retrospective definition. Menopause starts at the last period. And then you're in postmenopause for the remainder of your life. Perimenopause is that time, which may be three to five years or so, that starts as soon as your hormones start changing. And perimenopause is often the time when we see some of the most symptoms, you know, hot flashes, night sweats, changes in menstrual periods. Perimenopause also includes the time of hot flashes, and hot flashes actually can last well into postmenopause. Um, I can I can assure you, I'm still having hot flashes. So, so again, there's a there's a lot of variation here too. We have women that never have a sign or symptom of perimenopause. One day, their periods stop. They never have any problems, and that's all there is to it. That's probably the minority of cases. So, but for some women, perimenopause lasts a year, a few months, five years. And for other women, again, it may, be, it may be that they have no symptoms until the periods completely stop, and then is when their symptoms really start. So again, lots of variations in how this all works. Well, what's causing it? It's the hormone changes that are causing a lot of the signs and symptoms. So during the reproductive years, until perimenopause starts, we tend to make hormones on a regular basis in a cyclic way. Very organized, regular periods, predictable for the most part. Starting in perimenopause, the hormone signals are changing. And so we have higher highs of hormones, lower lows. There's big differentials between the low and the high. The periods become irregular, so they're no longer controlled as well by hormones, which is one of the reasons why they can become so strange. And then finally, in postmenopause, that's when the hormone levels kind of hit ground zero and stay there. So that's when they're no longer having these major big transitions. What to do? Well, I think the first thing that, that I recommend is thinking about what are your goals. So in the woman who's weepy, those may be the goals. In the woman whose cognitive function is changed, those may be the goals. In the woman with hot flashes and night sweats who can't sleep, those may be the goals. In the woman where it's a sexual problem, sexual dysfunction, those may be the goals. So I think one of the things to do is really look at what the goals are. Just because you're in menopause doesn't, need you meet, doesn't mean you need to be treated. So as long as you're happy, life's going along, those are not problems for you. And for many women, none of those symptoms we just talked about are problems. Um, you don't necessarily need to do anything. Um, now that said, you do need to take care of your health. So again, there's prevention of long-term issues is important no matter what. Um, lifestyle issues is very important. And we always want to balance the pros and cons of anything that we're doing. So, um, so if you are having problems, there are lots of treatment options. And usually the first thing that we'll look at are the lifestyle options. Um, exercise, healthy diet, stress management can really go a long way for lots of women. I'll talk about hormonal options because I think that's one of the areas where there's the most confusion and the most interest in knowing, is this an option for me? And then finally, non-hormonal medications for those women where hormones may not be the right option. So lifestyle, sometimes this is easy as dressing in layers. 
or using fans. It can go a long way sometimes. Um, for vaginal symptoms, vaginal lubricants or moisturizers work for, work for some women as well as hormones do. Stress reduction, I think, is very important. And again, it kind of goes back to, you know, don't feel so overwhelmed with what you're doing that you can't take stock of what you should be doing and which direction you should be moving at the time of menopause. Exercise is a cure-all for everything. Um, it kind of helps with that menopause belly around the middle. Um, it helps with prevention of osteoporosis, prevention of heart disease, but it can also really help with the stress reduction, the, um, the sleep at night. Um, I mean, exercise truly is, if we could put it in a pill and give it to everybody, it would go a long way for helping. Um, there are a number of, oh, sleep hygiene, again, helps too. So if you're getting a good night's sleep, everything's a little bit better. Um, and then there's over-the-counter options, black cohosh, estravera, soy products. Now, although the studies are so-so on these, oftentimes they don't perform much better than placebo. In my experience, I've definitely had patients that have given me the feedback that these have worked for them. And so, again, especially if you're motivated to avoid taking, taking medications, um, I do think these are often worth a try. So hormone treatments. The bottom line is that you're missing hormones in menopause. It's a, it's a rapid transition. Your body is reacting to the loss of hormones that for the most part, the most effective treatment for the most symptoms is hormone replacement. But it should be individualized based on what your goals are and also what your risks are. Again, it's not going to be right for all women. Um, and, I, and I'm always a little concerned about the menopause specialists that say all women should be on hormones. I've had women you know, at very high risk for things like breast conditions that are, that are being handed hormones because that's, what, that's all they do is they, give, they feel all women in menopause should have hormones. Um, and they should have, it should be based on blood levels instead of symptoms. Well, to me, I really feel like our goal is that you have a good quality of life, that your goals are met, not an arbitrary number that comes up on a lab test. So the issues of risk and benefit really are where we need to individualize for each woman. And this can be a little tricky. First of all, we have to look at your baseline risks. Um, if you've had conditions that put you at very high risk of breast cancer, then we have to look carefully at what combination of hormones is right for you, how long you should take them, just how it weighs in on something like the risk for breast cancer. Likewise, for things like heart disease, um, some women with a high LP little a may benefit from hormones. Other women may not benefit from hormones um, when it comes to heart disease. So again, lots of different things. Maybe your only long-term risk is osteoporosis. You know, maybe hormones are the best way for you to to put yourself in a good position for preventing osteoporosis in the future. So again, it's not necessarily indicated for that, but it may be that it'll kill multiple birds with one stone. It may turn out to be the best thing. The age of a woman and how long she's been in menopause, we now recognize as being critical issues in the whole risk-benefit analysis. And I'm gonna, I will address that a little bit a little bit more, but basically the younger the age when you start hormones, the lower your risks. And the shorter the time you've been in menopause, the lower your risks of having serious complications. And then finally, there's, there's a big issue that's become more clear, and that is that there are different risks when we give women a combination of estrogen and progesterone compared to if we give them 
estrogen alone. For women who have a uterus, giving them estrogen alone increases the risk of uterine cancer by about seven times. And so we have to be aware of that and have to do something to protect the uterus. That's where the progesterone comes in. So for women who have a uterus in place, we generally need to use a combination of estrogen and progesterone. Now, there's different strategies that we can use. Nowadays, we'll sometimes use a progesterone-containing IUD as a way to give the uterus um, progesterone. So again, different ways we can do it, but it's something we have to be conscious about because estrogen and progesterone has a greater risk of breast cancer and a greater risk of heart disease than estrogen alone. So always, these are all things that whenever, when, again, I, I totally don't believe in just handing women hormones because these are all complex issues that should be, um, that should be looked at. Now, one of the reasons why, um, why the conversation about hormones has become complex goes back to, I'm kind of dragging up history here, but goes back to 2002 when the WHI results came out. And this, this took everybody by surprise because our retrospective studies had shown that women who took hormones had a lower risk of heart disease and had had a lower risk of mortality, in fact. And so all of a sudden, they did this randomized controlled study called the WHI and came out with the conclusion that there were more risks of heart disease, more risks of breast cancer. Now, it was a little, the results were a little confusing. I mean, the newspaper came out very clearly saying, use of hormones gives you a 30% increased risk of breast cancer. And women just went off their hormones in droves, you know, picked up their fans, had their hot flashes, were just, were often miserable because of going off very suddenly. Um, and these are basically what the data showed. Now, these are with estrogen and progesterone. So I'm going to show you the estrogen data later. But again, these are just estrogen and progesterone. Well, the relative risk of heart attacks was an increase in 30%. That actually meant that there were 3.5 extra women per 1,000 women who might have a heart attack. So. 3.5 in 1,000 doesn't sound nearly as bad as a 29% increased risk. Um, strokes, 41%, four women in 1,000. Breast cancer, 26%, four women in 1,000. Clots in the veins or venous thromboembolism, 211%. Now that is a big one and that is a real one. Um, again, was nine per 1,000 women. But when we look at the actual numbers of increased women, it's much more reassuring than looking at the, what are considered the relative risks. So, um, and there were some benefits, of course. There was a decrease in, in colon cancer and there was a decrease in hip fractures. Um, another way of looking at this is in a graph form. I, I won't go over this, but basically it, it shows you that, yes, there's an incremental increase in the patients who were on hormones, which are the blue bar graphs, compared to the women who were on placebos. But, you know, all women who were in this age group had a relatively high risk of heart attack, stroke, breast cancer, and so the increased actual risk, the increased numbers of women, is relatively small. But again, huge reaction to this. Now, there are these increased risks. So again, I'm not trying to minimize it that if you don't, it's one of the reasons if you don't need hormones, you shouldn't be on them. But if you do need them, you do want to look at what these actual numbers are to make a decision of whether the risk benefit is worth it for you.
Right. Well, you know, I'm going to save questions for the end, but I, but again, these are old, these are old studies. A lot of this has changed. And so, um, so I totally agree that a lot of it has changed. The average age in the WHI study, and these are some of the, some of the criticisms, the average age was 61 in the WHI study. Most of these women, so the average woman, had been off hormones for about 10 years. And so very different risks for the average woman in this study. So again, it's um, not, this is, th but this is what the world reacted to. And this is what we still hear a lot about. Um, and these are the estrogen only results, which didn't get talked about very much because they came out a couple of years later. The estrogen and progesterone part of the study was stopped early. So in this case, there were actually fewer heart attacks. Um, again, more strokes, but less breast cancer. Um, again, we had an increased risk of deep venous thrombosis, though not as high, and um, not much change in, in colon cancer, but there were fewer hip fractures. So again, these data look quite different, and the bar graph form shows, looks like this. Um, really, the only statistically significant increased risk on estrogen alone was the strokes, although the blood clots was close. Most things came out as being pretty neutral, um, and then there was, if anything, what looked like a decrease in breast cancer and hip fractures. One of the things um, is this issue of timing. So timing makes a huge difference, is that for women who are just starting menopause, their overall risk of heart disease is less, and, it, and their risk ratio turns out to be less in terms of increased risk of heart disease. So if you look at just this, um, if you look at just this top area, what you see is women who were on hormones less than 10 years, although it's not statistically significant, but they did have actually a, a decreased risk of heart disease. Their overall risk was decreased. Whereas the longer they were off, uh, the longer they, the longer since they went through menopause, their risk increased. Um, it increased, you know, every ten years they had they had a increase in re in risk. And then the estrogen data is even more is even more convincing that if women had been in hormone off, if women had been in menopause less than ten years they appear to have a decreased risk of heart disease, not quite statistically significant, but very close. And then the longer they've been off hormones, the long, excuse me, the longer they've been in menopause, the less, the more likely they are to have risks accrue. Um, this graph is the same if we looked at the age of the woman so again, the younger the age, so women who are in their 50s when they start the hormones have basically graphs when it comes to heart disease that look very much like this. And same with breast cancer. So again, all of these risks that we've been worried about do seem to be related to how long a woman's been in menopause and what the age of the woman is when she starts the hormones. Well, this all starts to make sense then because the retrospective studies were looking at women who went on to hormones as soon as they went on menopause. And those studies were always very reassuring. So again, the WHI study, although it's still our gold standard, it's still our randomized placebo-controlled study, um, it has a lot of faults in the study. So when are hormones the best option? The time when women have the greatest need for them is when they're having hot flashes and night sweats during the perimenopausal time period, when they're going through the transition. So it's that first three to five years or so where they're going through the transition. 
when is their risk the lowest for any kind of serious diseases, heart disease, breast cancer, strokes, their risk is the lowest at the same time during that first three to five years or when they're going through the transitional period. So again, this is, it's very reasonable to consider hormones at this time. Um, now things like breast cancer start to increase after five to 10 years, so, so this doesn't mean women should be on hormones forever, but they can, may significantly improve their quality of life if they take them for those three to five years when their symptoms are the worst. So again, just not for everybody, but, um, but it, a good reminder. Hormone treatments, um, there are synthetics. Again, Premarin, Provera was what was used in the WHI study. Um, we virtually never use those anymore for multiple reasons. Um, the trend has been to use bioidentical hormones. Why not use the same type of hormones that women make? Um, and so estrogen or estradiol is one of the three hormones that women make. We now have multiple FDA approved types of estradiol that we can give women that work very well. Um, they come in pills, in patches, in gels, in sprays. There's definitely a move to use the um, transdermal, so that would mean the patches, the gels, the sprays, because those don't go through the liver quite the same way as the pills do, and so they have a lower risk of deep venous thrombosis. Remember, one of the, one of the side effects that was significant was deep venous thrombosis, so we can really minimize that by using transdermal forms. Now, for some women, the only concern they have is vaginal dryness. And for women where the only concern is vaginal dryness, their goals may be met very well just by using vaginal estrogen. And we have lots of options there, too. We have a ring. We have tablets that can go in the vagina. We have creams that can be used. So again, lots, lots of options depending on what meets your needs, what works for you, what's easy, you know, effective, et cetera. Um, compounded estrogens are um, not recommended by the American College of, of Obstetrics and Gynecology. Most of, the, um, most of the powers that be feel that they don't have any advantages, that there may be disadvantages in terms of having different dosing or, or problems in the compounding itself. And since we do have FDA forms, there's not much reason to, to use compounded. Again, with some rare exceptions. Um, the progesterone can also be given in pills. Um, or as I mentioned before, sometimes if our only goal is to, is to reduce the risk of uterine cancer in the uterus, we can do that rather nicely by using a Mirena IUD. And then your systemic treatment is a estrogen alone, which we feel has lower risk than the combination of estrogen and progesterone. There are also non-hormonal options. Um, if hot flashes are the main problem and perhaps you've had breast cancer or some reason why you really should not take hormones, um, some of the antidepressants can be used in very low doses. Um, we've used Effexor for a long time, and Brisdel was just recently FDA approved. Brisdel is similar to Paxil. Um, gabapentin can be used off-label. That's a medication that's used for neuropathies and, and seizure disorders, uh, but it does work with hot flashes as well. And there's just been a new medication, which I don't even have on here, that's, um, that, that has, let's see, has it been FDA approved? If it hasn't, it's really close. I think it has been. It's a combination of a CIRM and Premarin. So it's like Premarin alone plus 
a selective estrogen receptor modulator. And we'll hear more about that, but maybe it's going to be, you know, the perfect medication. The only thing I see about it right now that I don't like is the fact that it's oral. And so there is going to be the increased risk of deep venous thrombosis. Um, for vaginal dryness, uh, again, we don't worry too much about the vaginal estrogens, even for women potentially who've had breast cancer. Um, although, if you're on an aromatase inhibitor, you really can't use even the vaginal estrogens. And now we have a new kit on the block that's been around for about a year called Osfina, which is a pill taken by mouth, a non-estrogen. Um, it is actually a serum, so it acts like an estrogen on some tissues, but it acts like an anti-estrogen on other tissues. And then finally, if sleep is the whole problem, sometimes just addressing the sleep can go a long way in addressing all of the problems. So not to forget long-term issues, um, again, osteoporosis, 50% of women will sustain fractures in menopause. It usually happens much later, but the time to start paying attention to exercise and calcium and vitamin D really is, is during the perimenopausal time period. That's when the bone loss really starts. Um, heart disease. It's the number one killer in women. We start to see an acceleration of heart disease in menopause when you don't have those protective estrogens anymore. And so, um, so again, paying attention to exercise, <laughs> healthy diet, lifestyle are all very important. And then cancer, again, there's some, the same things. Exercise reduces the risk of breast cancer by 30%. The same things that are going to keep you healthy in terms of your other organ systems are also going to help reduce your risk of cancer. So thinking about change, thinking about how to address change, um, look at your lifestyle, make sure you've got that in good shape first.